My name is Bruce Herman. I'm a member of the art department here at Gordon, and I'll be hosting our, our session on faith and art. I'd like to also extend a special welcome to our distinguished guests in the audience and also to all our members of the community in attendance this morning, and invite you all to participate in our discussion in, in a few moments. I'd like to introduce our guests, um, but, in a, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about our session. At Gordon, we celebrate the Christian liberal arts tradition, and, and let me define that for a moment. Uh, we are a, an orthodox believing community, but we're also equally committed to uh, academic freedom in the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. Uh, our focus this morning is the fine arts, but when we say the fine arts, in many people's minds, that immediately conjures up an elitist enterprise, a luxury that is only available to very few. We, we often distinguish between high art and low art, but this morning I'd like us to explore uh, the possible connections to be forged between art and faith and excellence in the arts, but also to move us a little bit from that, those presuppositions about excellence, that excellence is always inaccessible. It's always the province of the very few. Why, for instance, did C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Dorothy Sayers, Charles Williams, and others, why do they choose to do their best work in popular mediums, children's books, science and fantasy fiction, detective stories, and the like? It's interesting to note that Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy is second only to the Bible in terms of the number of translations into the number of languages, and also the number of copies in print. And that doesn't even begin to deal with the popular you know, Peter Jackson movie series that was a blockbuster and broke all sorts of records, um, The Lord of the Rings. So this morning I'd like to introduce our guests and, and ask us to, to think together about high and low, about popular culture and the fine arts. Mako Fujimura, on my left here, is an artist, writer, and speaker who is recognized worldwide as a cultural influencer by both faith-based and secular media. A presidential appointee to the National Council of the Arts from 2003 to 2009, Mr. Fujimura has contributed internationally as an advocate for the arts, speaking with decision makers and advising government policy on the arts. Fujimura's work is exhibited in galleries around the world, including Dillon Gallery in Chelsea in New York City, Sen Gallery in Tokyo, the Contemporary Museum of Tokyo, Tokyo National University Fine Arts Museum and Oxford House, Tycho Place in Hong Kong. As part of an ongoing collaboration with composer and percussionist Susie Ibarra, Fujimura has painted live on stage at New York's legendary Carnegie Hall. As a popular speaker, he's lectured at numerous conferences and universities, including the Aspen Institute, Yale, Princeton, the Kew Conference, and International Arts Movement. Fujimura's second book, Re Refractions, A Journey of Faith, Art, and Culture, is a collection of essays bringing people of all backgrounds together in conversation and meditation on culture, art, and humanity. Additionally, Fujimura founded the International Arts Movement. On his left is Todd Komarniki, our, our second panelist. He's a writer and film director who first and foremost is a fine writer, and his breadth of topics and variety of genres are impressive. His Hollywood credits include the Christmas blockbuster, Elf, which starred Will Ferrell, a heartwarming and entertaining tale about an infant stowaway on Santa's sleigh, who ends up as an elf growing up on the North Pole, but one day returns to New York City to find his real father causing happy havoc and eventually winning the heart of the city while becoming a catalyst that causes his hardened businessman of a dad to get off Santa's naughty list and onto his nice list. Among his other screenplays is Perfect Stranger, starring Bruce Willis and Halle Berry, and Todd's acclaimed novels include Free, Famine, and War, revealing how he is able to move with agility and grace between sheer fun and the depths of grief and existential questioning. We're blessed to have Todd with us this morning, and. Uh, uh, he's a representative of extremely high achievement in the media industry. Lastly, on uh, Todd's left, is Sarah Groves, an American contemporary Christian singer, record producer, and author. 
She received her Bachelor of Science degree in History and English in 1994 from Evangel University and spent four years teaching school in Rosemont, Minnesota before recording her first album, Past the Wishing, in 1998. Since then, she has released more than a dozen albums and appeared on many others. Sarah has been nominated for three Dove Awards, including New Artist of the Year in 2002, Special Event Album of the Year 2003 by the Gospel Music Association, and she was named Best Christian Artist uh, in 2005, and her album Add to the Beauty was named Album of the Year in 2005 by CCM Magazine. Additionally, Fireflies and Songs was named the Best Album 2009 by Christianity Today. And presenting uh, in this morning, after presenting in this morning's symposium, Sarah will perform for the entire Gordon campus, uh, both at chapel and also this evening at 8 p.m. in the A.J. Gordon Chapel. So welcome, everybody, and welcome to our guests. Really very, very happy to have you here. Just to get us started, I've got a couple quick questions to, for you to possibly interact with. But if you want to go in a different direction, that's fine. Um, question one. Does faith make a difference to your artistic choices? This might include subject matter, style, target audience, art collectors, etc. If it does, what difference does it make? It's a big one. Uh, very general, I know, but see what you can do with that. Second question, who are your conversation partners in culture? In other words, where do you find genuine stimulation, dialogue, challenge to grow artistically? And what relevance do those conversations have, both with your Christian commitment and what relevance does your Christ Christian commitment have to those conversations? Lastly, kind of a related question. As an artist, how much of your thought and energy goes into imagining an audience, a recipient of your work? Or are you pursuing your art more for more deeply personal reasons um, and goals? So those are some really big general questions. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great to be here. Last, last time I was here, I, actually, I was, um, well, two times uh, I, I came to Gordon. First time I, I saw the beautiful, um, the, whatever this is. Is this, is this an <laughs> estuary or bog? Or it's a pond. <laughs> it's a pond, okay. And, and um, um, then, then I was asked to uh, uh, do a, uh, this commission, which, 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 which still um, is very important to me because it's, it's for your science building. <laughs> and I, I was really honored that um, I could do something for the science building because my father is a scientist. And, and this, this idea of um, art and sciences uh, connecting is very important to me. So I, if you go to the science building, you see this pine tree painting um, there that uh, is kind of... Uh, <coughs> echoing a lot of the what you see out there. Um, how does faith um, affect my art, my life? I, I, um, in, I would say uh, in every way, um, the, the way I think about this, I, <coughs> I went through this uh, traditional training uh, in Nihonga, Japanese style paintings, and I was there for six and a half years um, under this lineage program. And uh, my the professor that I studied under, his name is uh, Matazo Kayama. He is uh, one, of, one of the leading artists of uh, 20th century Japanese art. And he had a show in New York, and he was asked, so how do you see American art, um, or how, what, what do you think of New York, basically? And how, how do you see Nihonga in terms of the broader context of what you see in New York? And he said in a typical uh, stubborn <laughs> and you know, beautiful way, succinct way, he said, well, to me, everything is Nihonga. <laughs> so what he was saying, I think, is if you have been brought up under uh, any type of tradition or any type of commitment, any type of um, central premise, you see everything through that um, filter. And when I heard this story, actually he told this story to, to our students, and um, 
he laughed and <laughs> and it just struck me that this 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 person had something very important to tell me as a brand new Christian that it, it, that if to me if this belief system and and and, and photo uh, as a new follower of Christ if this meant anything it should at least mean that <laughs> That it to, to, to my professor, Nihonga is everything. You know, that he will see everything through the lens of Nihonga. Well, Christ is that lens for me. Um, and I, I, I believe that that's what I was beginning to process. And so that, sto that story is um, indicative of how I began my journey and I, I continue to... Um, pursue this strange and maybe marginal ways of processing um, oftentimes uh, best spiritual advice that I, I, uh, um, I find comes from the mouths of non-believers. <laughs> and I tend to process those uh, very deeply and, and hopefully biblically um, and try to understand and be challenged by what people say um, and, and learn from them. And so many of, many of my um, colleagues and people that I share my journey with, they're, they're people outside of church. Um, and yet um, I'm blessed to have people uh, like Bruce here. Uh, we're, we're collaborating on the project, um, upcoming project on for, for quartets, uh, T.S. Eliot's masterpiece. Um, and so um, I, I not only enjoy, but I, I really um, need that place as well. But um, at the same time, uh, uh, as an artist, I, th I think one of my particular privilege and um, actually gifting is, is to operate in the margins and, and uh, on, on the inside edge, as Father Richard Goa would say. There's, there's, you know, you're not an outsider, but you're, st you're still on the inside, but you're on the edge. And I, I think that in, in that place, you, you have th these very um, um, strange and wonderful conversations. Um, that um, refuse to get defined and categorized. Um, so I, I, my art, my life has uh, been known as marked by um, my um, commitment and, and uh, my explicit co commitment to photo Christ in, 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 in the art world of New York and Tokyo and elsewhere. But at, but at the same time, I, th I think it's, it's very dif difficult to define what I do, <laughs> really. And, and um, I, I, I recently, I, 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 I've come to the conclusion and that that's a good thing. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm not used to microphones. Um, it's nice to follow a painter because it leads into the story I want to tell because a painting saved my life. When I was 19 years old, I was attending Wheaton College, even though I didn't believe in God. And on a very cold January day, I left campus and was in the city of Chicago. I think we all know those days, those feelings when we feel cut off from everything, and most of all, ourself. And there was no place I wanted to be, certainly no one I wanted to be that was me. And just because it was too cold to walk around anymore, I found myself drifting into the Chicago Museum of Art. I wandered around all the people that looked like they belonged there. Everybody seemed a little more beautiful, a little smarter. That this was their destination. I was just hiding out. There was a stairwell that led down to an empty gallery, empty of people, filled with paintings, but empty of people. So I thought, this is a good place to go hide. And down the stairs, at the foot of the stairs, was a painting called Door to the River 
by Willem de Koning. I didn't know who this man was, certainly didn't know how to pronounce his name. And I stood in front of this painting, which is, if you don't know it, just a series of brush strokes, grays and blues, not representative of anything. And yet, it was a mirror somehow looking at this collection of wrist movements and color that this stranger had put on canvas years before. I was looking at a photograph of my soul, of exactly what it felt like to be me at that moment. And I stood in front of that painting and I sobbed. Tears ran down my cheeks, 30, 40 minutes I didn't, I couldn't move my feet. But I sobbed not because I was sad, I sobbed because I knew I was not alone and I could make it another day or two. When I was 29, a book saved my life. Now this was not a book I read. Um, circumstance and life had somehow guided me into being a writer. So this was, this was a book that I wrote. What had happened in my 20s as I had come to faith was that I believed that knowing Jesus and feeling his love was enough to make everything work out. That it was something that absorbed all the sorrow and grief and difficulty of life and, and not just redeemed it for all time, but redeemed it in time to make life somehow easier to do. But of course, that's not true. Life is filled with suffering and confusion and mystery. That didn't really equate with what I needed my faith to be. And I made a lot of bad choices because of that in my 20s. Late in my 20s, I wrote a book called Famine, which was an exploration of my disappointment that you could pour all your love into something or someone and have it not work out. You could lose. I found it unbearable to live that truth and so I wrote it down. My sister is an editor and she had edited my first, my first book, Free, so I knew she'd be ruthless. When I had sent that to her a handful of years before, she said, we need to meet face to face. I was expecting her to say, this is awesome, when's it getting published? <laughs> so when we met face to face, she said, aside from the first 50 pages, everything else has to go. <laughs> of course she was right. I laughed at her when she first said it, and I said, okay, I'll make a few changes. But then when I went and did it, I realized that the only thing that was left was the first 50 pages. So. I trusted her explicitly with my new book, which I felt was going to get the same treatment. She was living in Hong Kong, so there was a 12-hour time difference, and I called her on a midnight, on a New York night. I remember this, I was laying on my bed, and I said, okay, Kristen, give it to me, give me the straight truth. And she said, it's done. I said, what do you mean it's done? She goes, it's done. I can't, there's nothing for me to do with it. And what I realized is that I had written my way through my disappointment. I'd written my way through my grief, through my confusion, and that I was over that period of my life. I was free. And again, the tears came. Two and a half years ago, my mom died, and a song saved my life. My mom was an extraordinary person. I'm sure she's listening right now going, aw, shucks. <laughs> but as anyone who's lost someone very close to them, and suddenly it was, the grief was heavy and constant, and I would go to work and sit at my desk 
with all these things that I had to do, and I would just sit. And I would sit there for six or seven hours and not do them, and then I would go home. And I kept going to my office because I thought if I get away from home, I'll get away from my grief, but it was, it was there. There was, there was no place to avoid it. And that went like that for about three or four months. It was getting no freedom, no movement from it. And about 6.30 on a Wednesday night, I was just about to leave, and I put on iTunes, and there's this British band called Elbow. And they have a song entitled One Day Like This. Now, it's a, it's a song about falling in love. It's, uh, the lyrics are tender, but it's really about stumbling into love. It's not about a mother and son's grief or anything like that. But right at the end, the lyric says, throw those curtains wide. One day like this a year will see me right. And with the cello playing behind it and the joy of the singer's voice, suddenly the curtains got thrown wide. And I pictured my mom, who had been sick and in a room full of curtains and darkness as she left us, that her curtains had been thrown wide. And that that one day like this was going to be the rest of eternity for her. Life and free and flying. Now, the only reason a painting could save my life and a book could save my life and a song could save my life is because Christ saved my life. That he took this, uh, this young believer by the scruff of the neck and said, no leather pants for you. <laughs> you see, I wanted to be a rock star like Sarah. Not to say Sarah wears leather pants, but <laughs> Troy, you're going to have to let us know about that. Just, just, just at home with the kids, right? <laughs> but I really feel like I, I didn't choose to be a writer. I didn't want to be a writer. And, and God said, this is, this is where, you're, where you're going. And when the greatest storyteller of all time tells you to tell stories, it's, it's, it's good to listen. I, I joke with my friends that Everybody suffers in life. Everyone has pain and, and doubt and confusion, but only artists get to make money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that because the suffering uh, continues intermixed with all the, the deep joy. But I want to finish just by saying that once you know Christ, we either believe Romans 8 28 or we don't all things work together for good to those that love God not all good things happen to those that love God and the freedom that comes with knowing that everything is being knit together by the creator of the universe for good is the deepest truth that saved my life. Well, I wish I was in a band called Elbow, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm a solo artist. Um, I don't, but I don't live a solo life. I, I am, uh, one of the number one questions that I get asked is how do you balance your life? Probably because I'm a mother and a songwriter and um, uh, I owe a great deal of, of appreciation to my husband who's sitting up in the gallery, in the galley, galley, gallery. In, uh, on display in the gallery. <clears throat> um, but uh, music for me has always been, um, first and foremost, when I look at the most important things in my life, um, by my nature, I tend, in, in addressing them um, full on, I tend to destroy them, in uh, sort of like pinning a, a butterfly to a, a block of wood. Um, I This is going to be lame. I'm going to quote myself, which is so lame. To quote it's yourself. Totally not lame because she's awesome. If you don't know, she's <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I was actually steeped in the book Refractions that Mako wrote um, when I wrote a record co called Fireflies and Songs. And there's a song on there that says, I'm, I'm looking at the music box, I'm ripping it to pieces trying to find the song. And that's a lot of what my life is when I come at things in my own nature. Um, I tend to destroy the things that I love and, and trample all over things um, in trying to, trying to find the ineffable. And uh, I have found for me art and music, especially songwriting, since I was very, very young, I've been expressing myself this way. My mom says that I wrote songs about not wanting to walk the dog, and I was mad at my sister. I've been expressing, so I've been expressing and working out my salvation, really, this way for as long as I can remember. In college, I failed music theory. That was the first class I ever failed. And I, I left heartbroken, dejected. I, I just thought, as far as my, my goals of anything high were shattered. And uh, I was not going to be high. I was going to be low. And so I remember a professor of mine stopping me in the hall. And she said, Sarah, you're a you're terrible <laughs> student in a, in a technical manner. But you are one of the m more musical students I've ever had. And she said, you can be musical and not be technically proficient. And so I began to lean into the poetry and the words and the, um, what God had given me and to, to work in that and to, to make that high, make that excellent. And um, uh, it's been a joy. And, and I, but very much right out of my own, working out my own salvation, I feel like I'm able to somehow capture a, a slight shimmer of the ineffable when I'm writing music. And uh, that's really, those moments for me are, I, I live for those moments. Those are the throwing open the curtain moments for me. And uh, my community of, of uh, my creative community has um, been influenced a lot by Charlie Peacock, the art house in Nashville. Um, Mako doesn't know it, but his writings, I, I um, follow him on Twitter. And <laughs> that, that's only a more recent development, but have read his writings and have read his thoughts on art. And it's people like Mako and Andy Crouch and others who have really been speaking to me about my role in the community and not just writing for my own self, but um, that I'm a part. I honestly didn't have the self-confidence to think along those lines until I began reading um, Mako's work and, um, and other people, um, Culture Making by a Andy Crouch and others. And um, uh, so my husband and I have, um, we are opening a branch of the art house in Minneapolis in St. Paul. We bought a 100-year-old church. And uh, if you're not familiar with the art house, it, um, creatives often work alone. They're often isolated and um, are um, often working out of their homes, home offices and things like that. So the art house gives creatives on a local basis a reason to gather and hopefully collaborate. And I have met most of the people that I've collaborated at, with at the art house. And it's had a, a very uh, big impact on my life. And it kind of follows a, a Libri mentality of hospitality and um, just journeying together. And so we're, we're excited to be launching, um, investing really all of who we are. Um, at every level, we're investing everything we have and who we are in the art house um, in St. Paul. And so that's our next step as far as engaging with the community. But um, I can't remember all three of your questions, but the, I, would, I would close by saying, um, as far as the tone or my role uh, it, it, as an artist, uh, I found a great deal of freedom uh, along, <coughs> excuse me, I'm often working in boxes that, that don't fit me, the denomination that I grew up in, these different parameters and things. And um, even CCM music, you know, what does that mean? And I uh, um, have a lot of friends who have crossed over into general market music and who am I, what am I going to do? But I've always felt... Um, very encouraged by, uh, uh, I love Jeremiah. I love, I love Jeremiah because he's always been my favorite prophet because we don't just get his prophecies, we get his personal diary about what it felt like to be a prophet. And I won't, um, I don't purport to be a prophet, but I often feel like God has me living things out um, on a personal level that then I write about and then other, it relates to people and speaks. Um, and I take a lot of comfort in his, in God's question through the prophet Jeremiah when he says, where are your wailing women? Where are the women who will teach your daughters to weep? Um, who will just look at the way things are and will comment on uh, the, the brokenness, the broken places. And at the same time, always reflective about um, this, this good news, this gospel, and um, that it shines into every, every corner. And that's not 
tying everything up with a bow, to, to have this sort of infused um, hope in, in what you're writing and what you're sharing. And so um, that's, that's the freedom that I have, both to be a wailing woman and yet at the same time reflecting, uh, reflecting hope and, um, and to, to bring the whole of the gospel to bear on any situation that I find myself in. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Those were really wonderful introductions to our conversation this morning and a couple things caught my ear and I wonder if any one of you want to take a crack at expanding on it or if you just want to talk with each other about it. Um, a couple things caught my ear. Uh, one, I know from other conversations with Mako and the project that we're collaborating on that destruction seems to be the occasion oftentimes for great creativity. Now that might be a case like where you described Sarah you know, smashing the music box to find something that still has a song in it. Right. Or in Mako, I know in your case, you've been to Japan after the 311 um, devastation of the tsunami, and, uh, and I know you have some thoughts about that, but, but you also lived at Ground Zero, uh, and were running through the debris to try to find your family uh, that day, 9-11. Todd, you also talked about um, having to destroy most of your book after you talked to your sister who loves you. So there, there's something, there's some, there's some little germ here, I think, that might be worth teasing out in the conversation. Uh, anyone go for it if you think it has. But it, it's funny, I think, in a lot of conversations, we think of creativity as always being a building process. Sometimes it's a destroying process. Sometimes a demolition squad comes in. So maybe, I don't know if anyone wants to take that further. You know, if I, if I could just respond to both of you, um, you know, Willem de Kooning, um, it's actually having a major show coming up, and I know I'll be living there. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So let's, let's you, you and I should go, 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 go together. Um, but there's an interesting story about him, and it relates to both of you. Um, what you said, um, he he was a commercial artist. He, he he's an extraordinary uh, draftsman. If you see any of his, you know, even though he's known as his uh, abstract pieces. Um, his, his, his drawings, uh, po portraits, and uh, they're, they're exquisite. Um, <clears throat> and so he, many, many of the artists in, in early 20th century, they, they, they didn't have this notion that you can be a full-time artist. Um, and it wasn't until this guy, Ashio Goki, uh, who dared to own a studio in U Union Square and called it, this is, my studio, and this is what I do. <laughs> um, <coughs> and and William de Kooning was influenced by that, so he, he went out you know, and, and got his own studio, and he said, this is my studio, and this is what I do, I'm an artist. Now, the reason, it seems, why um, his studio became so important for the community was that he uh, and his, his wife wanted the, the first, oh, actually I think what happened was they, the money that they had saved up from his jobs, they, they spent it on this record player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, uh, whatever the early version of that is. Um, and um, so at night they would play music and people would just come over and start, you know, this, Party, I guess, and 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 became this community, and that, that's that's how um, <clears throat> you know the um, early 20th century abstract expressionist movement really began was because <laughs> they spent money on music, um, and and there's there's something very poignant about about that uh, story uh, to me how how. Um, we need each other, we need community, we need to be intentional in creating it, maybe even sacrifice <laughs> something for it. Um, and I, I, I've always valued that. William de Kooning is one of my inspirations as well. Um, and I, I, I write about his work um, very much. And what's interesting about him too is that later in his life he had Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and he couldn't do anything but paint. Mm -hmm. And there's this huge controversy. I'm sure you all, you know, you read about this in New York Times when the his show opens. But you know, how do you treat a master um, and and losing his ability? Um, lay his. Uh, what do you do with his paintings? You know, is it is it just as valuable as it was before? Mm -hmm. 
And, 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 and to me, when I see his late paintings, uh, I, I'm just enthralled. <laughs> uh, to me, they're so important to me because they have this um, the, the sophistication, um, but, but the, 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 there's nothing left but his intu intuition. Right. So, so you're looking at um, the most basic reality of who he was a, as a person, there, there was no pretense, and there's no, there's nothing left, and you know maybe that relates to, uh, and and to me there, there's something deeply rehumanizing about um, the very simple, bright, colored strokes that. Um, is well, I would say there's there. no anxiety yeah. in his late paintings, because yeah. when you're in the presence of his yeah. of his famous work. Yeah. It makes you anxious, or makes mm -hmm. you deal with the things that make you anxious, mm -hmm. and it's um, it's chaotic. Even even yeah. if there's a, a heartbeat at the center of it, it's very you know grabbing and bracing. Yeah. The late work is childlike, and yeah. it's like someone yeah. has let go, mm -hmm. and last photographs before I go to heaven kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, it feels like that. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, those paintings also have. I don't know if you are aware of Willem de Kooning's work, but they're they're always large. They tend to be always large. They're very generous. They're full. They're very painted, abstract paintings, full of energy. I don't know if you can picture them, but the late work, one, one he was suffering from Alzheimer's, is incredibly beautiful, and simple, and childlike. And you know, Picasso once said that only only children and great artists can make art. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's true. And he was all his life trying to dodge the bullets, as it were, of his own professionalism so that he could stay alive to his work. Wow. Sarah, you know, the image, what you said about, you know, you're not a solo flight artist, that you, your work comes out of conversation and community. Um, I wonder if you could maybe say a little bit more, and feel free to talk more about yeah. Art House if that's important to talk about. Well, um, I've been thinking a lot about this idea. Um, participation, you know, at every level. I feel like art and church both have been sort of removed from the common experience. Mm -hmm and they've been handed over to the professionals. Let's let the professionals play sports. Let's let the professionals do the art. Let's let the professionals um, you know, bring the word to us and worship for us. And, um, and I, I think the, that art and church and sports are all at their best when they're fully participatory. I think about 1800s baseball, when a whole community would leave church and go out with their picnic baskets and everyone would play. Everyone would, would go out in the field and uh, would play, you know, wouldn't be a big deal. Now, um, from very early age, our kids are in, you know, little leagues, and they're they're being on a track of excellence. Everything is about this, not not to put down excellence, but um, participation. And so I love this image of this this artist at the end of his life, um, returning to this childlike um, play in his in his art. Um, for me, the um, the community that that I've been in. Uh, with uh, Charlie Peacock, he, is, he and his wife have spoken a lot in Detroit in my life. Uh, in 2005, I came to Charlie and I said, um, you know, what's the point of words? I feel like um, there's so many words. Everyone's talking, everyone's blogging, everyone's emailing, and there, there just is such a, an overabundance of ideas and opinions. And um, I said, I really am honestly feeling like I want to go into something more hands-on. I want to become a nurse or a lawyer or something more that direct. Because um, lawyers don't use words. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that was. It was a fit. It was a fitful night. I was so I, I went to Charlie and said, um, I wanted I wanted to do something, you know, hands on, and uh, he told me the story, and many of you probably already know it, but of of the artist, um, the cello player in Sarajevo, during the Bosnian War who uh, looked outside of, right outside of his apartment window, saw a bread line of women, men, women, and children, and a stray bomb had struck, uh, had taken the lives of 21 people and standing in this line. And he took his cello uh, as a member of the Sarajevo Orchestra, and he went in the middle of the bomb crater, and he set up his cello, and he began to play uh, this beautiful adagio, which itself had been um, salvaged during, after World War II, they found the, the, they don't even know who wrote it, they found the, this song in the wreckage of World War II in Germany. So he, he picked this song, this adagio, and he played it one day to commemorate every, every person that had died. And uh, he, a lot of people say that, that his protest, because of the media attention, hastened the end of the war. And um, this image, to me, became such a, a 
mobilizing an image of the believer and, and, and the artist in their community. That in the face of chaos, um, I am attempting to play a song of, uh, maybe a mournful song, but a song of beauty. I'm, I'm responding to war and chaos with beauty, with art. And, um, and I'm evoking, you know, uh, sympathy, empathy in people, hopefully, as I play in the middle of this bomb crater and responding. I feel like this is my goal as, a, as an artist, and uh, it has been the gift of community for me to challenge me to, I want my marriage to be a beautiful song in the middle of chaos, chaos and, you know, relational dissension, and I want to be a good mom, and I want to my music to resonate, be a beautiful protest in the in these places. So uh, that was sort of in, that was a moment in in uh, of crisis where my community uh, of friends helped me see that this matters. This process of retelling the gospel matters, and and every time we approach it, we come carefully and we, we retell, we could tell this story a bazillion times and never come to the end of it. So uh, that, that really freed me up again to, to tell and tell and tell and come at it again, uh, you know, to try to tell the story as often in as many shades of color as I possibly could. Yeah, and just before we move on about destruction, it's not a separate thing. It is, it is the gospel. Unless a seed dies and falls into the ground. Jesus chose to do it the way he did it. It's not an accident. It's, we're going to watch it happen now, the beginning of fall, that the earth, the creation, all of creation is, is in rhythm with the story of Christ. It's completely linked. None of it, none of it is separate. We, we spend all our, times trying to, all our time trying to separate everything, people from each other, groups, the great unanswered prayers in John 17, ironically prayed by Jesus himself about unity. We have to concentrate on the things that bring us together, and the things that bring us together are that we all know Friday. We all know Good Friday in our lives. When all hope is lost, we were, we were going to win, and we didn't, and it's never, it's never going to get bright again. We all know Saturday when we're still sure that that Friday was the defining day, but maybe maybe Sunday's real, but no. And most of us live almost every day of our life on Saturday. But the fact is that we're people of the resurrection. We're Sunday people. And so when destruction comes, because it will come every day, all day, in some manner, like my two-year-old daughter, set up the blocks, knock them down, <laughs> immediately go find them and put them back together. That's, that's life. That's the way God wrote his story and our story, the story. So God bless destruction. <laughs> Can we coach on that, Todd? <laughs> Todd Coomer McKee, bless destruction. You know, another, another word that sort of has emerged um, in our conversation here, and in a moment we're going to invite all of you into the conversation. I wonder if maybe as a last thing, and, and if you want, we can just address the audience and draw them in as well. The word that is hovering over what all three of you are talking about this morning is hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear it. You actually explicitly say it. But it's not a cheap hope, is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to be something that is only, in your own process as artists, only comes in a costly way. Um, yeah, where do we, how do we create images, songs, stories that, um, that people can believe really have an element of hope in them? Because there is so much pain in the world. And, and uh, it's not some, it can't be something cheap. It can't be something glib, right? Um, I mean, Todd, in your film Elf, which if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Um, it, you might be tempted to say, well, this is pop culture, it's just silliness, et cetera, but it's not a silly story. It's got silliness in it, thank goodness, uh, but it's, uh, it's a great story. I don't know, Todd, I mean, where did, where did that story come from? Well, it, actually, it's a great, great um, story because the writer, David Berenbaum, is a lovely guy, great, great human being, and he grew up in Northeast Philadelphia in a Jewish family, and in his neighborhood at Christmas time, Theirs was one of the few houses with no tree, no lights, no... And he longed for Christmas, the, the experience of Christmas. 
And so that was his feeling as a boy. The first two scripts he ever wrote were both Christmas stories. And one, one, of, one of them was Elf. So he was longing for something he was missing. And he wrote a, a story that was just, like I said to you before, light winds. That's the, the thing in Elf, not to over-dramatize something that's really just a nice souffle. It's not, <laughs> it's not a full meal. But what, what's, uh, what's lovely about Elf is that in the beginning of it, the buddy the elf is vulnerable and filled with light and he's sort of broken and he doesn't fit in as an elf and now he's going to go to New York City and New York City of course rah, is going to destroy anything tender and gentle but he goes there and he changes New York he changes his father but he changes the city he goes from being thrown out by security guards to being hailed by everybody in in the town yeah. and the central truth of that is that, and I believe this completely, is that light wins, that again, going back to Sunday, you know, Sunday wins, we, we will get through this. I would challenge everybody to just sometime today or soon, look back over every aspect of your life and try to concentrate, try to hone in on those days or those months or those years where you thought, I will not get over this. I will not recover from this one. I won't make it through this broken relationship. I'll miss my brother, my mom, my friend too much. I won't recover. Look at them all and then see that you're still here, able to look at them all. We recover, we are held, we are loved, and that's why we have hope. You know, going back to your first uh, question about high and low. Um, it's really fascinating to me as, as we talk here that the, there is this um, wonderful reality uh, in which all of our stories are affected by, I mean, <laughs> you're writing Elf and your influence like what I'm decluding. You're talking about Sari and you know, fading <laughs> um, music theory. Um, <laughs> and they, they just, they, they, it is like, almost like uh, divine comedy because we, we, <laughs> we're, we're in this, um, you know, you know this, this categories we create uh, in, in life and, and there's this high art and low art. Um, and we need, I suppose, the expertise, the, um, uh, the deep commitment of the traditions and histories and and, and so forth. Um, the, we probably need both the elite, you know, cultural makers and grassroots at the same time. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's all linked. Uh, you know, my wife, who's here, uh, she's a psychotherapist, and she decided that she needs to be a counselor at the age of 12, right? Uh, reading Jane Eyre. Um, affected by Helen Burns, telling Jane Eyre, um, that uh, no, there, there is God, there is hope. Um, and um, I think we, you know, talk, talk about liberal arts education um, and how I, I always say liberal arts education should liberate. And, and in, a, in this setting, I can even say, you know, I say that in secular universities, but I can say here that liberal arts education should liberate, liberate us from our bondage to decay and brought, bring us into the glorious freedom of the children of God, Romans 8. It, 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 there's this path, that journey that we're on and, and the highest of uh, caliber of what we can bring in every sphere, the purpose of that it should, should be to liberate people liberate us from our bondage to gay and, and great art is generative. It, it will bring us to that point and allow us to tap into the mystery, you know, that that whole wonderful passage in uh, Romans 8. So so I, I'm actually um, grateful um, really to be part, part of this conversation because I, 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 it really triggers something deeply, I, I actually hopeful in me, 
um, that that I, I'm, I'm um, as an artist, you know, you <laughs> you have your moments feeling uh, isolated and alone, and you know, especially it, uh, relationship with the institution of the church is always tenuous. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be uh, among among people and, and this occasion as well. I know Michael, uh, Lindsay wants us to have this kind of deeper conversation um, in, in, in these communities, students, um, and I, I, I appreciate that, uh, the, you know, being able to have this here. We're very grateful to have the three of you here to talk with this morning. And I'd like to invite uh, anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question. Uh, please go ahead. Yes. I'll repeat the question up here. So go ahead. No, you can call me Marco. That's fine. And so I, I need to repeat the question yes, for the recording. Uh, the question is, what is the relationship, Mako? How did you come to the understanding of the relationship between art and science? And then was there a particular point in your life where you saw those things coming together? Yeah. Um, as with all uh, um, things family, you take things for granted, you know. My, my father is 86 and uh, he's going strong. Um, he's finishing several projects, books, and he's getting ready for a lecture in Kyoto. I'm gonna see him next week. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but I, d I don't think I really knew my father until um, I, I went to uh, school in Pennsylvania, uh, college at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, and I did it's about, it's about a three-hour drive from where <coughs> my, my my father lived in uh, New Jersey. Uh, it was it was driving to college. I, I got to know my father. Uh, he would drive me, and uh, three hours on the way, three hours on the way back, and um, I mean this this is. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's going to be hard to <laughs> hold, hold, hold it together here. Um, my son CJ is there at Bucknell. He's a mu music composition major. And um, recently, I was driving him to Bucknell three, three, uh, three hours. And I realized that, and, and he had just this experience, this actually extraordinary experience for us parents who. Uh, you know, wondering where CJ is at in all, 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 all spheres of life. Um, and uh, he came up to me and said, you know, I just had this religious experience listening to Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> and so I decided, we don't own a car, so we have to rent. So we, <laughs> we rented, I, I decided to rent a good car with a sound system, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I got Beethoven's fifth, and I, I put it in there, and I wanted him to tell me what he heard. And I realized that my father had influenced me in this. Um, this, this interest toward classical music began with my father, because he would, he would come home and play in this quartet that uh, his, he and his fellow scientists um, would come home and somehow, you know, play the <laughs> beautiful music. And I would be upstairs just listening, you know, just <laughs> mildly interested. Um, but so many years later, um, he, his love for music um, kind of seeped in, passed through, <laughs> and, and here's my son. Um, and we're having this kind of a really father to son moment here as I did with my father. And you, you know, he is a kind of a scientist that truly valued creativity. He, he, 
in fact, he saw himself almost as an artist more than a scientist. And he could not understand why modernist fragmentation led the scientific fields to be so fragmented and so cold um, that beauty, the idea of beauty, was no longer talked about. Uh, that idea of something working together intuitively um, even before you can put data points. Um, and so I, I didn't realize really what I had until much later in my life. I think uh, when I was maybe about 30 or <laughs> somewhere around there, I, I realized, oh my goodness, what an extraordinary person my father is. And so I, I went back and read all his papers. I didn't understand half of it, but I, and because I wanted to ask him, you know, what was he thinking? And recently I was at the uh, International Arts Movement Conference and the topic was on generativity, you know, being generative. And so I'm about to give my lecture and I had invited Dr. Calvin DeWitt, who is a renowned scientist from the University of Wisconsin. So I wanted my father to be there, so I invited my father. And, and I, we were walking over, I was about to give this lecture on generativity, okay? So my father asked me, so what are you gonna speak on? I said, on generativity. And he said, oh, do you realize that the reason that I was in Boston at MIT studying under Noam Chomsky, the, the time, you know, you were born, <laughs> my thesis was on generativity. <laughs> what? <laughs> Really? <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm like about to give this lecture and I can't, I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, I thought I had this original idea. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> there is this, uh, and, and that's just a funny way of saying, you know, that it, it's all connected. There, there's just, and, and I think more we progress into 21st century, the more we realize these connections. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're a scientist, engineer, a nurse, or uh, a teacher, or, or an artist. We, we have to realize that it's, it's, it's coming together in some sense. And it's, it's time that we look back on those who have gone before us and, and really begin to understand what they've done. Um, because they, they can tell us, give us, you know, they, they probably know what we're going to talk about <laughs> before, <laughs> you know, I should ask my father, you know, what should I talk about, so. That's a great story. Thanks, Maka. Other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, get, set me straight if I don't get this right. Have you ever been in a situation where you were introduced as a Christian artist and you preferred just to be simply introduced as an artist? Or conversely, have you ever been introduced as a Christian artist and you wanted to go hide? No, I'm, 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 adding, I'm, I'm extemporizing there a little bit. I'm in CCM music. I've been introduced as everything you can imagine. I often, in the early days especially, would be at churches that didn't want to call it a concert. They wanted to call it a ministry, you know, service. <laughs> and I said, well, you can invite your neighbor to a ministry service, but if you invite them to a concert, they, they might come show up. Because <laughs> they know what a concert is. So I'm, you know, and especially uh, when we first started, we've been doing music for 13 years now, and uh, early on there was a lot of conversation about the sacred and the secular. Um, that, those conversations have morphed a lot, and the, those lines have blurred. I'm grateful for that. Um, I myself fi find myself um, feeling called to speak to the church. Uh, a friend of mine once said, who's also a songwriter, uh, he said, um, I, I write to the church because the last time I looked, the church isn't free. And um, I feel similarly compelled. I, don't, I have friends who, you know, they're like, I'm going to play in the bars because that's where people, you know, are. And they do, and that, that's their, that's their um, sphere. That's their sphere of influence. And, um, but I've always felt called to kind of reconcile those pieces of myself and just to be who I am. And uh, those labels, people introduce me different ways, and it doesn't bother me. But in the early days, it was always kind of like defining myself as this sacred you know, and yet um, not, I, the general consensus was that you just don't want to be um, in a, you know, restrictive box where people would assume things about you before they've even heard your music. And I think that would be the thing I would most push against. It's like, well, why don't you listen to the song first and then, and then 
let's have a conversation from there. I'm just happy to be introduced. <laughs> <laughs> this is Todd Komernicki. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I always say that uh, the word Christian should be a noun mm -hmm. and not an adjective. And, um, and I, 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 think, I think that's, that's basically um, how I view it. Um, I don't mind being introduced as a Christian I, or follow of Christ, um, but I, I guess I do mind being a Christian artist because it's not only uh, devaluing uh, of what that word means to me, um, but um, it's also devaluing of art as well. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's something very mysterious about what we do as artists. We can't put label on it and market it. It's, it's kind of a marketing mechanism. So whenever I, I bristle against any kind of mechanism that says intrinsically what you do is so we can package it and sell it and you know make, make money off of it. When, when art, art is really a gift, that it's, um, it's not a commodity. Um, and um, now you can, you can function in, in the business side of art and do that well. Um, and I'm not against that at all, but, but it, the reality is uh, when I think we, f we begin to lose our first love when, um, when we continue to operate in that mode, so. <laughs> That's best. Thanks, another question? Yes. Well, if you wait about 10 minutes, it'll end. <laughs> I'll repeat the question for, for, the, uh, for the, the, uh, the recording here. Uh, set me straight if I don't get this right. Her question was, you know, we can talk about hope and making art that's going to inspire people to, to see a, a way out when there's, lots of, when there's destruction everywhere, but how do you create art that's vital, that has life in it, when everything is cruising along in a comfortable way? I actually do want to jump in and answer in a serious way. Um, and I'm not going to single this person out, I, and maybe it's more than one person, but someone in here just reminded me of something that allows me to answer this question in a very direct way. Presence. When we are fully present, then we tell that story. If it's a prosperity story, a praise story, then we're able to do that. If it's a Sadness story, we're able to do that. The only way to do that is to be present. And we are not present. We, we've never been more inundated with books about how to be present. The power of now, now, now. Nobody is fully present. It's a, it's a challenge, and it's, I think it's only done by grace. But we live in a culture now that we expect to not be present. So the person that I'm gonna single out, I'm not gonna close my eyes so we don't see which direction, but somebody was texting on their phone. We tell ourselves there's an emergency, we need to be in touch, we need to, you know, this or that. That's, that's just the lie of our time. That's just our culture has convinced us that we need this leash. We all became doctors with beepers. What, what happened to, to sitting alone with your thoughts? What happened to dreaming? You have to be present to do those things. And it's all gone. Just take a train ride. I came up from New York. Just take a train ride. And every person that was alone was either on the phone, texting, checking their phone to see if someone had gotten in touch. No one reflects. We need, we need to be present. And when we're present, the joy surfaces as well as the, the mix because it's never just all prosperity or all sorrow. They're always intertwined. So, presence. Thank you, Todd.
Do you want to address I was going to say, C.S. Lewis says there aren't as many, there just literally aren't as many words for joy as there are for sorrow and suffering. And I've often felt stunted when I go to write about the good stuff <laughs> without, so, to, to uh, give it as much care and as much, um, you know, have it be as, uh, as substan substantive as the songs about despair. And that kind of bothered me. And so I, I, um, I started thinking about that. How can we create p images, new images and new, you know, to make that a part of discovery. But found, like, like Todd said, that often it just, uh, on its own, it, it, it just shines so much brighter in the light of despair. The joy shines so much brighter in the light of despair. So often, you're, you're, uh, a lot of Christian music is writing about point B, and I've always found myself at point e A, wondering how you get to point B. And I feel called to write process music that starts at point A and then sort of, you know, reflects on what point B, uh, how you might get there or what that might look like. Or, um, so I, I think that, but we, uh, we literally don't have as much language for uh, the victory moments as we do for the, I guess, the daily life of, of, you know, in our world we will have trouble. But we're surprised by it. The thing, I always go back, if anyone hasn't seen Immortal Beloved, I highly recommend it. It's a movie about Beethoven, Gary Oldman. And it so articulates the fact that he wrote Ode to Joy while he was deaf. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he, his head is right up against the keys. And he's just trying to hear the tiniest little thing. And you know, we know Ode to Joy mostly as the, the lyrics of a, of a hymn. But when you hear Ode to Joy through the ears of someone who could barely hear, and then when they show him conducting it for the first time, and the audience is sitting there, and all they are receiving is, is the joy and the beauty. It's just washing over them and he can't hear it. He didn't write that out of prosperity, except for the prosperity that God gave him with that overabundant gift. So he was, he was present to receive that when it came, no matter how he was feeling. And that's exactly what my son experienced. Mm. He understood that gap and he, he realized music, music theory can't explain what he did. Mm -hmm. That was his religious moment. Uh, and, and I was like, wow, you know. Um, I, I mentor a lot of young uh, people and I, I come to the conclusion that, um, you know, I think we do a fairly good job of preparing them for failures, mm. but we do a horrible job of preparing them for success. We just don't understand how, how to do this um, in mentoring people. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm actually haunted by that question myself so and, and actually we're going to end with that question we're at the end of our time so feel free to be haunted with that question today <laughs> um, but also feel free to celebrate today because we have a, a great thing going on on campus here we've we've welcomed a new member to our community who's going to be our leader D Michael Lindsay I know a number of you in the audience are his friends and associates and so we're really glad you're here on campus we're glad you're here to celebrate with us um, now we're going to move to the chapel service in a few, few minutes. Sarah, I know you have, need to get over there for a sound check, probably. But thank you very much for being with us. Let's thank our guests.